Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. You know, I was thinking as I was listening, it's, uh, I, I love to listen to music. I can't sing a note. I can't carry a tune in a bucket. But I love to listen to music. And, you know, when I hear gospel music, uh, it's always more meaningful to me to know the person singing believes what they're singing. And uh, Brother Larry is a grace believer. He's another person that rightly divides the word of truth, has a wonderful testimony of salvation, and uh, I certainly enjoy his music, and uh, I appreciate all of those that have musical talent that are able to share it because uh, there's plenty of us that don't have any, and uh, so I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, before we uh, start the message today, I want to, uh, first of all, welcome those that have joined via the internet. Uh, you know, there's uh, there's always that thought in your mind, you know, if anybody's listening, or does anybody care? Uh, we we spend a, not a, a great deal of money, but there is cost involved, obviously, uh, in paying for the uh, websites and so forth to, to get the message out. And uh, from time to time, uh, we'll hear from people. And I want to share a letter with you, particularly for you at Grace Bible Church here. I was going to do this during the announcements and forgot to. Uh, but uh, this is from a, a gentleman by the name of Jeff and his wife's name is Lane. He said, Brother Atwood, thank you for the ministry of Grace Bible Church. My wife and I live in Georgia and have started listening to the live broadcast from your church website. I also list, enjoy listening on YouTube. I have stage four prostate cancer and am not in the best of health, but rejoicing in spirit, knowing the gospel of the grace of God. Thank you for all you do. Uh, you are in our prayers daily, uh, Jeff and Elaine. Uh, I appreciate people writing and letting us know. And uh, it's a wonderful blessing to hear from people that the 
broadcast is a blessing too. And for those of you that, that broadcast, I know uh, there are numerous broadcasts that go out over the week. And sometimes it seems that no one's listening and maybe not the numbers aren't showing up. But you never know when somebody's going to go back and listen to a message and receive a great blessing from that and even be saved. Uh, I remember when we first started on radio, and I've told this story before, but uh, it was back a many, I guess we'd only been on radio for a few months, and I can't even remember now how many years ago that was. But we'd been on radio for a short time, and of course at the end of the broadcast, uh, we always give the name of the, uh, the church and the telephone number, and we use my home number. And uh, so I got a call one day, and the 11 o'clock, we were being played at 11 o'clock at that time. And uh, I got a call about 11.45. program ran from 11 to 11.30. And this person, I could hear in the background, as soon as I answered, a lot of traffic noise, like cars going by. And this fellow said, is this Brother Atwood? And I said, yes, it is. And he said, I want you to know I just listened to your radio broadcast and I want you to know that I just trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And he hung up the phone. I didn't get to ask him his name or anything else. But that's not what's really important. He cared enough to call and to think that somebody could be driving down the highway, listen to a 30-minute broadcast and be transformed from death into life it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to know the power of God's Word. And that's why we do what we do. It's because the power is in the Word, not in ourselves, not in our ability. All right, in Philippians chapter 4, I want to talk to you today about peace. And primarily the peace of God uh, that passes all understanding. And how we can have that peace and some things that sometimes we perhaps misunderstand, misunderstand about the peace of God. Uh, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 5, uh, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Uh, be careful for nothing. And that word careful there would be like, don't be anxious. Uh, be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, Whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. I don't know of a time uh, in my lifetime when it's more important than to understand and acknowledge. Is that me preaching? <laughs> uh, I, thought, I thought I was getting a feedback there. I don't know of a time there's ever been in, I, in my lifetime when verse 8 would be more important in relation to what we think. Uh, you know, as a man thinketh, so is he really. <laughs> and, and the fact is that he said in verse 8, he, verse 7, he said, the peace of God which passes all understanding should keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And then he says, tells us how that comes about. It's easy for us to think about things in the worldly realm and in the natural sense instead of thinking things in a spiritual sense according to the Word of God. So he said, whatsoever things are true. Well, where do we find truth? The Word of God. You know, you can't depend on the news media. You can't depend on media. You can't depend on other people 
Uh, everybody's got an opinion about what's going on in the world and every different area of the world as far as that goes. I mean, has there ever been a time when you've seen more division among American people than there is right now about multitude of things, not just COVID, but the multitude of things. And so Paul said, whatsoever things are true, keep your minds stayed on the truth of the word of God. He says, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Now years ago, there was a man by the name of Norman Vincent Peale. Some of you probably heard of him, read his, some of his books, The Power of Positive Thinking. Well, here's really the secret, to uh, the power of positive thinking, is to think in accordance with the Word of God, and particularly our Apostle. Now verse 9, you know, I hear verse 5 through 8 read a lot of times or, or referenced, but verse 9 is really the key verse in the whole thing. And this ties exactly uh, into what Brother Mark was saying during our Sunday school hour, which we had some great discussion back there. Uh, Mark mentioned that he really liked the 10 o'clock hour because it was more informal and uh, it was discussion and that kind of thing. And I'm thinking, and donuts and coffee. But it was a good time of fellowship around the Word, and I enjoy that. Uh, I'm hesitant always to open the floor for questions during a message like this because you never get done with what you're going to say. But back there, we have more freedom and liberty, and I enjoyed the lesson. But in verse 9, Paul says, Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Did you notice the conditional, the conditions in that verse? He said, the things which you've both learned and received and heard in the Bible? No. And seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Well, what would be the reverse of that? Those things which you've both learned and received and heard and seen in me ignore. And the God of peace shall not be with you. Now it doesn't mean that we're not saved. But I believe folks earnestly. And I base this not only on the word of God but on personal experience in my own life. That true peace can only come through acknowledging the truth of the word of God rightly divided. Amen. Other than getting saved, the greatest blessing in my life is when I begin to understand the word of God rightly divided. Amen. I was on a radio, a, a internet broadcast a few weeks back and I, got, I had the opportunity to give my testimony. And when you tell people that you were you joined the church, walked the aisle and so forth when you were 12 years old and you started preaching at 18 and seven years later you got saved. Sometimes it gets real quiet. Like how can that be? Well I'll tell you how it can be is that and I would never for one moment try to imply that you have to understand right division as such to get saved. But when you're depending on verses like in 1 John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. The, when I began to see and understand about right dividing the word of truth, what that did for me was it illuminated the gospel of the grace of God and the gospel of Christ. And I saw that what I did as a 12 year old boy was just vanity. I walked down an aisle. I didn't even repeat a prayer. All I did was fill out a little card. And it said on that card, how are you coming? By profession of faith, by transfer of letter. Well, I didn't have a letter. And so I just, I just put profession of faith. Now think about this. This was a church probably about the size of this church in, in size. 
and the auditorium was packed. We had an evangelist. It was a Friday night. And when I went forward down there, not one person, they had people down front, you know, passing out these cards, talking to you. Not one person asked me if I was saved, asked me if I understood how to be saved. All they did was have me fill out that card and tell me that a week from that Sunday, they were going to have a baptismal service and I was going to be baptized. And so that's what I did at 12 years old. There's been a lot of people get saved at 12 years old. A lot of people. Or, old, or even younger. But for me, I was putting stock in the fact of what I did. And so, years later, we moved to Chattanooga here in 1972. And we immediately, we first joined the Southern Baptist Church and then found this church and began to read and study the Bible. Bought me a King James Bible, began to read and study it, began to see differences. And that brought about conviction. And I didn't have peace. And then Mary came home one afternoon. She'd been up here and spent several hours back here with Brother Frank Lowry talking to him about her salvation. And she came home and told me she'd gotten saved. Well, that was easy for me to believe about her. Because she didn't act saved like I did. I'm just kidding. <laughs> she, she acted a lot more saved than I did. That's why it was so shocking. But she said she got saved. And I didn't really accept that in the, the sense of, of the joy that you should accept it with. I, as a matter of fact, I remember just clearly that as soon as she told me that, I said, well, that's wonderful. And I went outside and started splitting firewood. And I thought, how can this be? How can a person think they're saved all this time and then not be saved? Well, a few weeks later, we had a Bible conference here. And I began to, again, be under conviction. Brother Moore, uh, there's one thing he could do. He could preach salvation. He could make it clear. Matter of fact, years after I got saved, I told him, I said, sometimes, Brother Moore, when I hear you preach, I almost wish I wasn't saved so I'd get saved again. But I talked to him one Friday night after the service, right back here in this room, it was an office time, and I asked him, I said, I'm not sure about my salvation. He said, what do you want me to do about it? He said, you preached the gospel this morning. We'd had a, a Bible conference that started on Wednesday and went all the way through Sunday. And I said, well, I don't guess there's anything you can do. He said, the question, there's only one question, is that is, do you have a Savior? And I said, well, yeah. And as I walked away from there, I thought, yeah, I was 12 years old. I got joined the church. I'm sure I'm saved. And I'd roll over my mind over and over about, well, I must be saved. I mean, I pray and I get answers to my prayers. And then about two weeks later, on a Sunday night, the preacher was preaching from Colossians chapter 2, verse 10 through 13. And when he got down to verse 13, he read how the... Well, let's just read it. Let's quote it. Colossians 2, verse 13. And you, being dead in your sins... And the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. You see, when I was a teenager, when I would sin, which was every week, I'd go to the altar and pray, confess my sins, and feel better until the next Sunday. I've always joked that the preacher could pretty well depend on having one decision every week because I was going to decide to go down and confess my sins. And that night, it was like a light came on. And I said to myself, you fool, you have been trying all this time to figure out if what you did was enough, and it has nothing to do with what you did. Christ hath forgiven you all trespasses. And I received that that night, and I claimed it. I didn't jump up and shout. I didn't go tell anybody immediately. 
But from that night forward, I realized that to doubt my salvation would be to doubt what Christ accomplished at the cross. And I had peace. And I desire that peace for others. Well, how did that peace come about? It came about through the preaching of Paul's gospel. You see, today, when people preach the gospel according to Jesus, as this man Mark referred to in Sunday school does, and would teach that you've got to be committed, the question is, how do you know when you're ever committed enough? If all of your sins were not forgiven at Calvary, how do you know that you have forgiveness of sins? And it's not about your confession, it's about receiving the free gift of salvation. And so when Paul said, those things which you have both learned and received and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you, I believe that's speaking to the fact that true peace today comes through believing the word of God, but also through believing the word of God rightly divided. Because if you're claiming the promises and the instructions of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, let me tell you, you're not going to have real peace. Let me show you an example. Go back to Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus Christ is teaching about prayer, starting in verse 5, and you get down to verse 9, and he says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if we forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Now you know there's multitudes of people that have been they've lost peace over that verse right there. Because there's a conditional statement. And there are people who have hatred and animosity in their heart toward somebody else and they have found that it's almost impossible for them to forgive that person and they believe that unless they do, they can't be saved. I heard uh, this fellow out in Texas, uh, can't remember his name right now, he's got a huge church out there, I think it's in Houston, it's not Joel Olstein, it's that other guy, but... Uh, uh, anyway, he was preaching on this passage. And he just flat out said that if you have not forgiven your neighbor, if you have not forgiven me in their trespasses, God will not forgive you. Well, think about how that contradicts exactly what Paul said in Colossians 2.13. He has forgiven you all trespasses. And then you get over to chapter 7 and verse 7 and Jesus in his teaching the disciples and those around said and it shall be given you uh, ask and it shall be given you seek and you shall find knock and it shall be opened unto you. I can't tell you folks how many threads I've seen on Facebook where people have requested prayer which I believe is spiritual or, or scriptural. But the fact is that people will respond and say, uh, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke this disease. You're healed. And then the person dies. You know what they base that upon? They base that upon the Word of God. And there are multitudes of people today that have doubts about the Word of God because they look at verses and don't understand 
the context, the audience, the speaker, and so forth, and rather than understanding that today we do not have the promises that God made to his disciples that were kingdom promises, we do not have the promise of ask and you shall receive. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. We do not have those promises today. We're still told by our apostle Paul to pray about all things. But we pray as the scripture tells us to. Understanding that we don't have the promises that were given to Israel. But thank God neither do we have the curses. We have, we have the grace of God that he says is sufficient. And God's grace is sufficient. But there are multitudes of people today because they do not rightly divide the word of truth. They believe they have some type of power and that prayer is some kind of magical thing that they can ask and receive. And you just wonder what goes through my, the, the, the minds of people when they make those kind of claims and then it didn't come to pass. Well, most of them, and I'm not trying to make light of people because I know that, that people are sincere and they're earnest and they're, they're doing what they believe is right. And it's sad to me. It really is. That people don't understand because they don't have the peace of God. It's like, I remember particular lady that was had cancer and people were praying for her and it was a it was a prominent individual that was not well known here in Chattanooga and they were praying for healing and she didn't get healed she ended up dying at a young age and immediately people said well our prayers were answered she got the ultimate healing. Death. You see, there's always going to be an out. Think about it. They were praying for physical healing. They weren't praying for ultimate healing. You see, when people are in an era, they don't really want to admit it, so they'll make up, and this is kind of goes back again to what Mark was talking about. How is it that people can't see by simply reading the scriptures the differences? In the kingdom doctrine of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the teachings of Jesus, the letters in red, they can't see the difference in that and what our Apostle Paul says to us. Pray about everything. But we also read that Paul prayed three times that the thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, might be removed. And he said, all my grace is sufficient. Now, you know, I think there's a, a, when we talk about peace, there's at times a misunderstanding about what real peace is. And it's particularly, I think, in the situation where someone's sorrowing over a loss of a loved one. Uh, peace is not always just being happy about the things around you. Peace is about being calm in the midst of the storm. In the midst of what's going on. I mean, a person loses a loved one, they hurt. They sorrow. Paul said, we sorrow not as those which have no hope, but we still sorrow. And sometimes it's, it's almost unbearable, but even in the midst of that sorrow, we can have the peace of God which passes all understanding, knowing that there's life beyond this life. This isn't the end all. This is just, we're just on the road to where we're all headed. The song says, this world is not my home. We're just passing through. Look in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. You see, to have the peace of God, it starts by having peace with God. 
Uh, in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Paul said, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, he said, in light of what he has just said, like in verse 25, he was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. That means that God is not angry with us. God, you see, every book that Paul writes, he starts out with grace and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, one of the, one word that is opposite of peace would be wrath. You think about over there in Acts chapter 1, where the disciples asked Jesus, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Well, what was the restoration of that kingdom going to be? It was going to be peace on earth, goodwill toward men. That's what the angels declared at the coming of Jesus Christ. But did they have peace there in the book of Acts? No. They were being put to death. They were being thrown into the dark lines then. I mean, they, they said, Lord, we're, we're looking for that kingdom. They knew they had the promises of him sitting upon the throne of David and reigning over the world in peace. But they knew to get to that, there was going to be a week of years. It's called the 70th week of Daniel. The day of God's wrath and judgment upon this world. And that's why Peter said in Acts chapter 2, this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. They thought they were right in the midst of that. And so they began to preach with a hope that Israel would repent. And so Peter said in Acts chapter 3, he said, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. I believe with every bone in my body that Peter believed that's going to happen in his lifetime. Or shortly after being put to death that the Lord was going to return and he's going to be resurrected into that kingdom. Because he didn't know about the mystery. He didn't know that God had a secret that he'd been keeping. And so they're preaching that 70th week of Daniel in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And it culminates in Acts 7 with the stoning of Stephen. And at that point, God would have been just to pour out his wrath that he had promised upon the nation Israel. But he didn't do that. What did he do instead? He saved our apostle, the apostle Paul. And he gave him a new declaration. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that, folks. Grace and peace from God our Father. The one that was going to pour out his wrath upon this world has decided to withhold it. And it's revealed to me, talking about Paul, his new apostle, this great and glorious truth that today, by grace, you are saved through faith. You're justified by grace through faith. Therefore, he says, being justified by faith. Hold on here and turn over to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians 2.16, Paul said, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Think about, think about the people that during Paul's day, and even today, believe that they've got to keep the law in order to obtain salvation. Or in order to keep the salvation that they obtained by believing that Jesus died for their sins, buried and rose again the third day. That's not, there, there's no peace in that. But Paul said, knowing that a man is justified not by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. You see, Paul, he tells us that 
Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. But we find out that it's not just our faith. It's the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ. That we might be justified, how? By the faith of Christ. How is that? That has to do with the fact that Jesus Christ came to this earth and became man and suffered all things that we do and was tempted in all points as we are tempted and he died on a cross, a cruel death, as a man not wanting to go there and praying, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. God's will was that he would go to that cross. And that on that cross he would be made sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And Jesus Christ believed. When he prayed in John 17. Father, restore to me. He said, I have kept thy, I've done thy will. He said, restore unto me the glory that I had with you before the foundation of the world. Now I know people disagree with me on this. Some people do. But I do not believe that Jesus Christ would have come out of that grave if God himself hadn't raised him from the dead. And I believe that Jesus Christ became totally dependent upon God the Father when he gave up his life and I think that's verified by the fact that he hung on that cross and he said, my God, my God, Amen. why hast thou forsaken me? And he gave up the ghost. And three days later, the Bible says, I think it's 21 times, God raised him from the dead. That's the faith of Jesus Christ. That's what brings justification. Not our goodness, not our ability, not our reasoning, not our doing good. He said, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ. And let me tell you something, folks. I don't care what people say or what they try to pretend. A person that does not, a person that believes they can lose their salvation if they sin or they don't do enough, that person does not have peace. I know because I've been there. When you're dependent upon your flesh and it fails over and over and over again, how can you have a peace of God which passes all understanding? Paul said, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Paul said, I was a persecutor. I was a blasphemer. But in me first, God showed forth all long suffering for a pattern to them who should hereafter believe. Notice down there in verse 20. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by what? The faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. You know what it means to frustrate the grace of God? It's to claim grace and then go about trying to establish your own righteousness by the law. Paul said, I don't frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness, now think about this, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Look back, if you will, to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, Paul is answering the question that surely was being asked by those at Rome and elsewhere. What about Israel? What about the Jews? If, if this new dispensation that you've been given, Paul, uh, is not of the Jew, if salvation is no longer of the Jew, what about Israel? And so there's a lot of people say Romans 9, 10, 11 were written to Jews. I don't believe that. I believe it's written about Jews. After all, Paul says in Romans chapter 11, I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. So in Romans 10, he said, Brethren, 
My heart's desire and prayer, I'm sorry, chapter Romans 10, verse 1. Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believe. Now think about that. Isn't that a perfect picture of where we are today with religion? People being ignorant of God's righteousness. What is it they're ignorant about? They're ignorant about the fact that they have imputed righteousness through the Lord Jesus Christ by faith in Christ. They believe they've got to do something to obtain righteousness. Listen, when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Bible says you've been made righteous. And the problem is that people, they say they got saved, and maybe they did in some cases, but then they don't notice a dramatic difference in their attitude, in their desires, and so they think, well, I must not be saved. And somebody comes along and says, now if you were really saved, you'd, you'd, you'd tithe, you'd give your money. If you were really saved, you would get baptized in obedience to the Lord's command. If you were really saved, you would attend church regularly. You know what that, what that does, folks? All that does is say that all those things are a requirement for salvation. I've been there. I hear what's said. And what the problem is today of every individual who is going around knocking on doors, paying for TV time, preaching and so forth, that believes you can lose your salvation. Number one, they do not have the peace of God that passes all understanding because they don't realize they have peace with God. They believe that somehow their works are involved. And they are ignorant of God's righteousness. And did you notice what Paul said? I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Have you ever noticed that the people who are most zealous about what they believe are the ones that believe that somehow works are involved in their salvation? I mean, when you see two guys out riding bicycles down the street in a white shirt and a black tie and it's 95 degrees, that's zeal. As a matter of fact, when Mary and I visited the Holocaust Museum up in Washington, D.C., there was a plaque there about the number of people that Hitler had put to death. It wasn't just Jews. He had over 200,000 Jehovah's Witnesses put to death. And they said of the 200,000 that he put to death, not one of them ever recanted their faith. Think about that. They died for a lie. That's zeal. But Paul said, these, these uh, uh, I bet they have a zeal of God. But it's not according to knowledge. Isn't that sad? That people today have the word of God completed, spelled out clearly, and yet you show it to them, and because the tradition of their fathers, the blindness of their heart, they reject the Lord Jesus Christ and go about to establish their own righteousness. I don't say that gladly, folks. That's sad. That's sad. And think about the people that are working and working and striving to be made right with God or to stay right with God when it's all a free gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. Back in Romans 5, Paul said, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Notice in that very same chapter, 
over in verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Paul said in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God. With that gift of salvation, I like to think of it as like a package deal. There is justification. There is sanctification. There is eternal security. We've all been baptized into one body. And all of it, all of it was the gift of God through Jesus Christ. For if by one man's offense, that's Adam, death reigned by one, Adam, much more they which receive abundance of grace. You see the word there, receive? You've got to receive it. And of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men of justification of life. It is a free gift folks. One other verse. Look over in Romans chapter 15. Peace of God comes through believing the Word of God. And believing it as God instructed it. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the Word of truth. Why is it the devil wants to get our minds off of the Word of God or people's minds off the Word of God? He'll use anything in the world to distract people from the truth of His Word. He'll do anything in the world to try to uh, cause conflict among the body of Christ. And man, have I seen that. And you have too. When really 99% of the stuff that we worry about and fuss about and argue about don't mount to a hill of beans because there's people all around us lost and dying and going to hell because they've never seen the truth of the gospel of the grace of God. Paul said in Romans chapter 15 verse 1, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good edification. For even Christ pleased not himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. And whatsoever things were written for time were written for our learning. That we through patience and notice, comfort, that comfort is peace. Comfort and peace of the scriptures might have hope. That's where your peace comes from. Being stayed upon the word of God. Knowing who you are in Christ. And knowing that this earth is not your home. Thus Paul said, set your affection on things above. Not on things on the earth. You're dead. And your life is here. With Christ in God. We are His. And we have a mission. And we have a ministry. And that ministry is to proclaim the glorious grace of God. And as I said a moment ago, the devil will do anything in the world to keep that message from going forward. He's blinded the minds of those which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ is shining to them. Thank God this morning for his peace. The peace that passes all understanding. Paul said, again, in Philippians chapter 4, the things that you have seen in me, seen and heard in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Believe the book. If you've never been saved, trust him this morning. If you are saved, put your faith in what this Bible says, not in what man says. And don't be distracted. Don't be, as Paul says, entangled in the affairs of this life and forget what our real ministry is. As he told Timothy, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove and rebuke with all long suffering.
and do it for Christ's sake. Would you join me in prayer? Our Father, we thank you this morning for your love and your mercy and your grace toward us. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you, Lord, for the peace of God that passes all understanding. And Lord, we know that even in that pit, that peace, many times there is sorrow and there's suffering, there's hurt, there's heartache. But we can rest in the truth of your word, knowing that one day we will see you face to face. In this earth, in this, in this body, we groan. But we have an earnest expectation of glory. And we thank you for that. And Lord, again, I pray for those that have lost loved ones. I pray for those that are sick, those that are suffering. And I pray that they might find peace and comfort through the Scripture, through the Word of God, and through your Spirit that indwells us. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here today. We're dismissed. I appreciate you being here.